Hi, I'm Chris Cooper. Welcome to The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Thanks for joining us. Believe it or not, it's time to start planting next year's garden. We'll talk about a number of things you could be doing right now to help ensure that next year's harvest will be better than ever. And Mr. D is going to show us how to do the Texas two-step. All that and more is just ahead on The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, so stay with us. This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Walter Battle. Walter is the UT Extension Director in Haywood County. And Miss Mary Wade is here. Miss Mary is my horticulture assistant over at the Shelby County Extension Office. It's nice Thanks to be here. Thanks for today. Oh, thank you for having us. All right, Walter, we're talking gardens, okay? Vegetable gardens, to be more specific. Yes. And we have some questions here we'd like to ask. So here's the first question. Is there a difference between powdered and pelletized lime? Uh, actually, no, it's not a difference. Mm -hmm. The only difference is that uh, pelletized lime is the ground lime that's been binded. Okay. So they can hold together. And the reason that uh, they do that is because it's easier for it to go through like a spreader or something mm -hmm. like that. You know, when you think about uh, powdered lime, ooh, that's, that's a mess to handle. Right. Uh, you know, it's cause so it's like flour, you know. Right. But when you can kind of get it granulated and pelletized, it's a lot easier to work with. Right, and mm -hmm. that powdered lime could be bad for you. You have uh, respiratory problems. Yeah, absolutely. So you need to consider that as well. And of course, when we talk about lime, we're talking about agricultural lime. Right. Here, yes. Okay, now speaking of lime, is this the time to apply lime? Yes, now is the time, uh, particularly October, November, that is the prime time uh, to put your lime down because it's gonna take that uh, calcium about mm, about three to four months before it's broken down enough where the plant can take it up mm -hmm. as a nutrient. So kind of do your math, you know, <laughs> right. you know, you're looking at November, December, you know, January, February, come March, April, it's ready to be taken you're up. Right on time, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. And lime, again, is just calcium, right? That's right. It's basically part. calcium. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what are some reminders for those that must store their agricultural chemicals? Which is a real good question because we get that a lot. Yes, yes. Uh, really, uh, it's best not to let them freeze, okay. you know, and I know some people tend to have that out in the garage or whatever that's not heated and it's sitting up there on the shelf and, you know, you start getting those, you know, 20 degree nights, 18 degree nights and things like that, they're freeze. Mm -hmm. And obviously that affects the, I guess, some of the chemistry involved, um, you know, you know, with those chemicals. And uh, another thing is also make sure that they're not leaking mm -hmm. or anything like that. We, you know, we don't want any kind of disasters like that. And, you know, and make sure that they're up away from where pets and, and little kids and things sure. can get to them because we don't want to have any accidents. Sure. And let me ask you this. How long can you store those agriculture chemicals? Oh, man. So some of them are pretty potent. I mean, years down the road okay. still. Uh, you know, of course, a lot of times, you know, we buy them as homeowners. We buy them in such small amounts, you know, and when you buy the concentrates, you only use a couple of ounces right. here or there. So, you know, but, you know, easily two or three years, they can easily store that long. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, what are some cultural practices for the garden site that could be done this time of year? Uh, a, a big thing that I like to do is just kind of look at my garden. And, you know, if I kind of remember where there was some drainage issues mm -hmm. and, and, you know, where maybe, I, I don't know, had pond, I mean, puddles in it. Well, now's the time of year to go out there with your shovel because uh, you wouldn't want to rent a bobcat to do this. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, you know, go out there with your, with your shovel and maybe, you know, fix that. You know, maybe add some sand or something to build something up. Uh, obviously, uh, in some of the raised beds, if, if you're having some issues with, you know, the timbers or something like that being loose or whatever, where soil is kind of sifting out or whatever, you know, okay. kind of fix all that uh, this time of year. Okay. Now, what are some good signs that I have good organic matter 
at my garden site. And, and I understand you have a demonstration for us. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Now, now let, let me just answer this first. Okay. Um, one thing where you know you have real good organic matter in your soil is if you have a lot of earthworms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess a little side shoot of that is if you see a lot of mold trails in your yard, that means you have a lot of earthworms. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, it does. So, you know, uh, uh -huh. good and soil also, environment. Right? Yes, and also if you see a lot of mushrooms mm -hmm. and toadstools mm -hmm. and all that stuff growing, mm -hmm. uh, that means you have you know good 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 organic matter there. Now I, I bought some samples here. Here's just some typical old garden soil here. Um, <laughs> you know, that came out of my garden. Oh, so that's but, out of yes, your garden. Yes, right? yes, okay. and. Uh, right. You know, uh, just, just you know, that's just what it is. It has some clay mixed in it. Uh, I've been working with it over the years because, you know, when the house was built, they took all the topsoil away. <laughs> right. And um, one thing that you would want to do, of course, up there in my region, in a big cotton-growing region, we have a lot of what we call gin trash. And uh, we take this uh, cotton gin trash, which has been composted, and all those weed seeds and things like that are obviously dead, and we add that to it. You know, because what you want to get is some good tilth into the soil, and, and, and I wish that they could smell this. This really <laughs> smells good, too. Uh, yeah. And then I also add some sand in there, and you just kind of mix all that up real good to kind of over the years build that soil up. And you can kind of tell that now that's going to be pretty good next year as we, you know, you know incorporate right. this into our soils this time of year <laughs> or in early spring, start uh, getting a lot of that in there. And see, this soil will drain. Yeah. It's got the organic matter in it again, you know, to add the tilt and all that. Just good stuff. And I can attest it does smell pretty good. Wow. Yeah, yeah. This is all that garden can appreciate. Yeah. This. Uh, so, yeah, that's some good know, soil. That, that's yeah, that's, that's pretty good there. Yeah. So, yes. we need to all come to your house and plant our garden, right? Absolutely. Come okay. on. <laughs> just come on. We'll, we'll, we'll just make you a spot somewhere. Okay. Yes. Well, we appreciate you doing that. While we have time for one more of these questions, uh, okay. are there any insects that gardeners need to be on the watch for next year? Yes. Um, you know, we're still uh, here in our region. Okay. Um, we're still looking for the, uh, what we call the uh, marmorated stink bug, the brown marmorated right. stink bug, uh, which, and also the spotted wing drosophila, mm -hmm. two pests that can be very destructive on fruit crops. Uh, also, we had another little fella came in here on the back end of last year, of this year, I should say, um, called the uh, sugarcane aphid. Ah, wow. and, and it's mainly a pest in the, uh, on, on the grain sorghum crops, but it will also affect corn. So if it affects corn, I know it affects wow. sweet corn. Okay. And it came in kind of late, and it can really be a, a pretty mean little pest. So, that, so they're pretty new. Yes, 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 there. just very new. And of course, uh, the kudzu bug, uh, <laughs> which uh, came in here last year. Uh, but we kind of noticed something about it. It kind of fell back a little bit. So we're thinking that the type of winter that we had, mm. kind of, yeah, yeah, may have knocked mm. him back some. So, so those are some, some of the ones that we're concerned about. And then there's also the little, uh, the uh, with the emerald ash borer okay. and the Asian longhorn beetle. Be on the lookout for those because they're very destructive to trees. All right, Walter, well, we appreciate that. Up next, Mr. D shows us how to do the Texas two-step to get rid of a fire ant mound. We're going to talk a little bit about how to control fire ants, and we're going to discuss the method that the UT Red Book recommends, the Texas two-step. Not talking about the dance, we're talking about a two-step method to control fire ants. The main purpose of a fire ant mound is to regulate the temperature and humidity where the fire ant brood is, is, is located. And that means during cool, wet conditions, the fire ant mound is going to be tall so that they can move the brood up a little higher in the mound. During hot, dry conditions, they tend to move the brood deeper into the ground and the fire ant mound is smaller. Fire ants do not use the mound as a means to enter and exit. The entrance and exit tunnels are all around me, around the mound. So if you start messing with a fire ant mound, better look behind you because they may be coming at you from that direction too. But they will, when you disturb a mound, the ants will uh, respond in a very defensive manner. They'll respond very quickly. So that's why I know that this mound is, has been abandoned because I would have fire ants coming out to the end of that stick very quickly. 
we do know where these mounds have relocated to, so let's move over to that spot and I will show you the difference between a vacated mound and an active mound. Here we have an active fire ant mound. I know because I've disturbed it just a little bit and we still have some fire ants that are moving around on this mound. Now this mound doesn't look very large, but it's like the tip of an iceberg. It's hot and so the fire ants have moved their brood down deeper in the soil and so you don't see as much of the mound here. But make no mistakes about it, there are plenty of fire ants in this mound. Doesn't take very long for the fire ants to get to the end of that stick and what they're trying to do is to defend their mound. Now, I'm probably not real smart standing here because as I mentioned earlier, the real, the true entrances and exits to this mound are around the outer perimeter of the mound. The first step of that method is to scatter a bait around the fire ant mound. You can do that on an, as an individual mound treatment or you, if you have a lot of fire ants in your lawn or, or turf grass, you can broadcast the bait according to the label directions. And what that will do is it will kill the queen. And unfortunately, the life of a fire ant is about nine weeks. So if the only thing you do is put a bait out and it kills the queen, she will stop producing offspring. She'll stop producing young fire ants, but the fire ants that are left will continue to live and forage and try to protect the brood for nine more weeks. Hence, the second step of the Texas two-step is to apply, apply a contact insecticide. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to get the bait and I'm gonna apply the bait and show you how I would do it. I will not put the bait on top of that mound. I'm gonna put the bait around the mound so that when the fire ants go in and out their normal entrance and exit points, they will find this bait. They will take it in and they will feed it to the, the fourth instar larvae, which is the only stage of the fire ant that can digest solid food. The fourth instar larvae will then secrete a liquid into a pouch that they have, and all of the fire ants will feed out of that pouch. Workers will take liquid out of that pouch to the queen, and it will kill the queen. So I'm gonna do that now. This is the first step in the Texas two-step method of controlling fire ants. There are several baits available on the market. You can go to the UT website, look at the red books. I'm gonna scatter it in about a three foot circle around the outside of this mound. And this is where their normal entrance and exit points are. And when they're out foraging for food, they, will find, won't, they won't have to go very far. They'll find this bait. And this has as a carrier a uh, corn base. They will like it and they'll take it and feed it to the fourth instar larvae. So step one of the Texas two-step has been completed. It'll take a few days for, for the workers to take this to the fourth instar larvae. The, instar, the fourth instar larvae will digest it, secrete the liquid that feeds the rest of the uh, mound. Uh, it'll kill some of the workers that that digest it, but there will be some workers that will survive, and those are the ones that we're gonna come back in seven to 10 days, and we're gonna treat with a contact killer, and I'm gonna use a, a drench to do that. We now are ready for the second step of the Texas two-step method. Seven to 10 days ago, we treated with a, a bait around the perimeter of the mound. Today, we're gonna go back and we're gonna, we're gonna destroy or try to kill the remainder of the workers. And you see, we still have some workers that are there. We disturbed that a few minutes ago and, and they're, they're, they're trying to defend their mound. But I've mixed, uh, followed the label direction of uh, an insecticide and there are many contact insecticides that are labeled for use in, uh, uh, as, a, as a contact killer for, for fire ants. And I'm gonna drench this mound with this mixture. I put uh, four ounces of active uh, of material in this water and stirred it up good. And that's what the label called for. Now I'm just gonna drench the mound. And I'm gonna, uh, this is different from the, the bait. The bait, we only 
treated the area around the mound. Well, I want to kill the brood and I want to kill the workers who've not died yet of old age. So I'm going to pour this insecticide water mixture right over the mound and that should take care of this fire ant mound. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. Hi, Ms. Mary. Our October to-do list for gardening. What do you have for us? Well, first, I'm happy to get out into the garden now that it's going to get a little cooler. Mm, got that right. And at least at my home, my most used garden tool is going to be a rake. Okay. Uh, the fan rakes are perfect to use. It's also okay, too, to use those leaf blowers. Mm -hmm. But I like to do something with what I rake up, if possible. and to create some good compost. You do have to have a little space to do that. Yes, you do. But you can also chop up those leaves and just put those back in the flower bed. You know, uh, they act like a very good mulch in mm -hmm. there in the flower bed if they're broken up a little bit. If you try to leave them in there whole, then they're gonna not allow good drainage. Okay. But I do want to caution you, however you're doing these leaves, see whether you're doing them, your husband's, do, your husband's doing them, Caution them to keep the things out of the storm drains. We Rats. do find yes. that that yes. happens a lot yes. with leaf blowers, and mm -hmm. that's something we really should yes. avoid. Causes floods, yes. Now, mm -hmm. I don't do the lawn care in my house, but I do uh, know that a lot of neighbors are out there fertilizing their fescue lawns mm -hmm. now. We're getting close to late on that. Right. But you can, of course, uh, fill up the spots that ended up being bare with your fescue lawn. Mm -hmm. You can rake that soil lightly, use your seed. You want to pat it down so it gets good soil contact. Mm -hmm. And then remember, what is going to grow is going to be very, very tender. So you need to keep yeah. that foot traffic off of there. That's keep right. the, try, try to keep the foot traffic, traffic off of there. <laughs> We don't want to do any pruning now, and that's oh, because we don't want to promote growth on those plants. They're going to get damaged in the, oh, in the, in the winter. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you can always do light pruning of cutting out the dead things. Sure. You yeah. know, but I wouldn't recommend whether it's a fruit tree or even just your garden shrubs. You really don't want to go out and heavy prune. Okay. Uh, it's time to divide those perennials. You can go out, dig those up, divide them. We're going to use those in that good soil that I'm going to create yeah. using Walter, Walter's information. Right. It's time to plant garlic this month. Oh, garlic. And okay. your sweet potatoes probably are already up. If they're not, you yeah. should check them because they're getting almost past time. Is that correct, Walter? Close to the close. end okay. to get those up. Later this month, you do want to put in those daffodils. Mm -hmm. Get enjoy those for the next uh, spring. It is the best time to plant all of your woody plants, yeah. your woody shrubs. And uh, the logic is they're going to establish their roots before they're going to be stressed next summer. Right. Yeah. Now, when you go to that nursery, you may want to check and make sure they're not pot bound. You don't want those roots girdled all around. Right. If so, then you'll want to trim some of those roots so right. that when you put them in the ground, they can spread out. Okay. Now, it's really time for the fun things, or fun wow, for let's me. Let's get to the fun and things. Fun for Miss Mary. <laughs> that's to go to your garden center uh -huh. for the color. You're going to have the color of mums, the color of yeah. pansies, mm -hmm. the, the ornamental kale, all of these things are going to be out there, even with a, a small budget, you can still get some good color for that garden. Oh, small you know. budget. I think I can handle a small budget. Yeah. Okay. That's what I have. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, don't forget you can bring some color inside from your own garden. Okay. Some of those begonias can be put into a pot. They're not going to like it as much in the house as they did outside. But rather than putting them in the trash, I'd try to bring a few of them in. Okay, well, we appreciate that. Our October to-do list yes. for Miss Mary herself. All right, here's our Q&A session. Miss Mary, you jump in there with us, okay? 
Uh, we have a viewer question and a couple of photos from Don over in Murfreesboro. He writes, I watch your program on WNPT2 here in Murfreesboro. Now, I have a question. Can I thin the limbs on a large Leyland Cypress to allow for a less full look and more airflow? So, Walter, we'll start with you. What do you think? I have no problem uh, with him pruning it at all. Okay. Uh, so I don't think it won't be any issues there. It's just kind of, I think, what he may can live with as the landowner, as the homeowner, you know, yeah. what he wants to look. Okay, Ms. Mary, Well, you're not really going to be able to take it from 12 feet to 6 feet. Right. Right. I got the idea that he wants it to be a thinner. But they will tolerate pretty severe mm -hmm. pruning. Mm -hmm. I've known people that have t topped them to make them into a hedge. Okay. You know, but... And what, uh, when is the appropriate time to do such pruning well, or trimming? Well, oh, not... Not now. Not now. <laughs> Not All now. Right. What? April? Mm -hmm. I think it was between April and April August. April and August, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so if you have any of those side shoots or anything like that, you can go ahead and, uh, you know, knock yeah, those But don't leave a, a, a dead brown stub right. in there. You want to right. cut to where there's a small green side branch, mm -hmm. which will then become the dominant branch. Right. Always cut back to a branch. That's for sure. And leave it, you know, dense at the bottom to allow for light to get yeah. in, you know, to that uh, Leyland Cypress. Uh, but, yeah, you see a lot in the area. Most people use them for screens right. uh, for the most part. Uh, but I will say this. Um, they're not high on our recommendation list anymore yeah. because right. Leyland Cypress have problems with cankers yeah. and yeah. ceridium. They, they get diseases. some diseases, yeah. and you right. really can't do much about them when no, they you get cannot. that. No. You're you going to have to give up on them. Yes, because there's nothing that the homeowner can spray to control it. So, Not uh, really. No, so you got to make sure if you do have, uh, you know, the Leyland Cypress, make sure that they irrigate it properly during mm -hmm. the summer times. They don't like wet feet, mm -hmm. okay? But, you know, Mr. Dunn, there you have it. We appreciate the question. All right, here's the next one. Uh, is there anything that I can plant right now in my vegetable garden? And this is for our vegetable guru here. I just really can't think of anything. Yeah. Right now, just that, you know, uh, I don't know of anything you can plant right now uh, in yeah. a vegetable garden. Now, we're into no. October now. And yeah. I don't... Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you had a packet of seeds, you could look on it and see days to first harvest. Right. But I'm afraid it's going to run you into mm -hmm. a where we're going to have a frost I, freeze. I think it is. Right. So, yeah, you're pretty late. You know, I, I did get the question about, well, can I plant uh, lettuce now or kale uh, and I think somebody asked me about something else, radishes, yes. but I, I think it's too late. It's too late. Know, it's too at late. This point. All right, here's our next question. All of the leaves have fallen off my ornamental oh. cherry tree. The leaves have Damn. small holes in them. Does this mean that the tree is dead, Miss Mary? What do you think about that? Well, <laughs> we do love our cherry trees, mm -hmm. and they do present problems. Mm -hmm. uh, the disease that I think you're thinking about, or talk, the Part the question is about is really a fungal problem. Right. Uh, the leaves have turned yellow and they are dropping and they don't always have holes but they actually call that a shot hole right. mm -hmm. and cherry trees are subject to that. Mm -hmm. Now sanitation is going to help again. You can get that rake back out. This right. time <laughs> rake up those diseased leaves right. and get rid mm -hmm. of them. Yeah, don't compost them, get rid of yeah, them. Get rid of yeah, them. them. Throw them away. Cherry trees just, uh, they can get bores, they can have mm -hmm. other problems. Yeah. So you may want to look at the trunk of that tree and make sure it doesn't have other issues. Okay, that's a good point. Yeah. Well, oh, you want to uh, add? Or? And if it is the shot hole disease, uh, next spring uh, at around uh, Petal Fall, they'll need to uh, spray that tree with some type of bleach solution mixed with water to start to start it off though, because it's, it's going to overwinter there. Quickly, for this last question, uh, are there any herbs that can be planted over the winter? Well, you know of any? Uh, I don't know of any, okay. just yeah. off the top of my head. Uh, okay. Ms. Mary? Yeah, I don't think yeah. you really should be planting them. Now, if you have some parsley out there, some thyme, some sage, that should make it through the winter, right. so you should. shouldn't mm -hmm. give up on your herb garden. But to try to start something brand new now, it just takes too long. Okay. All right. Well, you can always try to, you know, bring some indoors and, you know, try That's it that way. That's correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, other than that, 
I don't think you'd probably get away with it, especially if we had a winter like we had this past winter. It's gonna be real tough. Yeah, right. was, you know, on those herbs out there. It was tough. It was I, tough. Uh, I've always had a little sage that'll make it through until I'm ready to use it though. But Walter, Miss Mary, thank you, we're out of time. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us a letter or an email with your gardening questions. Send your email to familyplot at wknl.org. The mailing address is Family Plot, 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next time for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center, in Germantown since 1943, and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants, plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you.